Welcome, everybody. Welcome to today's impromptu and slightly delayed, 10-minute delayed Law of Self-Defense show. Sorry, folks. I was just about to launch the show, and I had a very important business call come in, and um, business opportunity simply, I couldn't let it go. So it took me a few minutes to get that out of the way, but now we are all here to talk about the Alec Baldwin manslaughter case. I hadn't planned to do a show today, but it's it's too good to pass up. I should have done it last week, but of course I was covering the Nikolai Mew uh, trial. So I um, took yesterday off to catch my breath from that trial, from that unjust conviction of Nikolai Mew. And, uh, but when I was going over kind of upcoming topics to cover next week, I was reminded of this one this one and i decided i may as well knock it out now so what do we have what we have is uh it's really in the description just about a month ago on march 14th alec baldwin's legal team mostly out of new york big new york law firm submitted a motion to the manslaughter trial court uh, to have the grand jury indictment against their client alec baldwin dismissed uh the their motion makes many claims of misconduct against Special Prosecutor Kerry Morrissey, who, of course, we just saw in the Hannah Gutierrez trial where she secured a conviction, a meritorious conviction, uh, did a wonderful job in that trial. She's normally a defense lawyer, of course, Kerry Morrissey. Um, she was in the uh, defense lawyer, I believe it was Dean Cummings, the skier in New Mexico, who was charged with murder for killing a, a, a local man um, he was planning to buy property from and uh, secured an acquittal for him. I did a great job as a defense attorney. I remember saying then, if I ever get charged with murder in New Mexico, I'm definitely retaining Kara Morrissey uh, for my legal defense. And somehow she got picked to be special prosecutor in the Alec Baldwin manslaughter case. Of course, Alec Baldwin charged with manslaughter in the shooting death of Helena Hutchins, cinematographer Helena Hutchins on the movie set of Rust. Uh, Baldwin was uh, in costume and handling what he knew to be a real revolver, uh, pointing it at Helena Hutchins, pulling back the hammer, manipulating the trigger, Unbeknownst to him, there was a live round in the gun, but he fired that live round and uh, that bullet, that fired bullet hit Helena Hutchins, passed clear through her body, broke her spine, fatally injuring her, and then lodged in the body of uh, director Joel Souza. Hannah Gutierrez, whose trial I just mentioned, was the armorer on that set, responsible for ensuring there was no live ammo in the gun when she handed it into the set. She was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter for having allowed that to happen. Uh, sentencing is sometime this month. If I don't believe it's happened yet. She's only looking at up to 18 months in prison, which is the maximum under New Mexico law for involuntary manslaughter. Shocking to me too, but that's how it is. Alec Baldwin's facing the same sentence. Uh, his trial is to start uh, mid-July. And of course, we'll be live streaming that. But his big New York law lawyers are looking to... Uh, to uh, secure a more pleasant outcome from their, for, for their client than what will almost certainly on the law and merits uh, and evidence be a conviction on the felony of involuntary manslaughter. So we're taking a look at these dueling motions. Uh, Kerry's motion came out, uh, was filed just uh, not yesterday, but the Friday before. I'm kind of catching up to it. And it is scorching. It is spicy stuff. Um, both the motions are about 30 pages long, so we'll get through them as uh, as quickly as we can. But really, I think they're, they're, they're worth going through in their entirety. Um, there was also some uh, legal review done by an attorney uh, commenting on law and crime that I think had a very bad take on the defense motion. Uh, if we have, if it seems we have time, I will uh, I will get to that as well. There's a slight possibility I might have to uh, take a minute or two out of the show in the middle to, de to deal with this uh, business transaction I was talking about. Um, but if that happens, it happens. That's what happens when you decide to suddenly launch an in impromptu Law of Self-Defense show. Let me make sure we're streaming where we should be streaming. If you're on the member dashboard, you probably had to uh, refresh your screen because I had to make a bunch of adjustments all at once at the end here. 
It is, however, streaming on the member dashboard. All right, so we're everywhere. Looks like we're everywhere we need to be. Let me go ahead and start with the formal launch of today's show. Here we, that's not the right one. Let's try this one. All right, so we're here to talk about this. But first, we have to talk about this. Today's show is brought to you by Law of Self-Defense in the form of our upcoming Law of Self-Defense Advanced class. This is our full-day class on how to be hard to convict if you're ever compelled to use force in defense of yourself, your family, your property, everything you need to know in a single day. We only teach this course twice a year. It's taught live by me. I'm there with you all day, streamed to your computer at Zoom plenty of opportunity for live Q&A to make sure everything's understood, but we only teach it twice a year. The next one is coming up in a week, April 20th. If you miss this one, it'll be October before you can do it again. And by the way, if you have a conflict with April 20th, I would suggest you sign up anyway, because we'll make the recorded playback of Saturday's class available for all registered students for two weeks following the live class, so you can watch it at your leisure over that two-week period, even if you are unable to be there live on Saturday. You can sign up at lawofselfdefense.com slash advanced. On that same webpage, we have a list of more than 100 questions. Self-defense law questions we answer in plain English. We talk about defense of yourself, defense of others, your family, neighbors, colleagues, strangers, like an active shooter event. We talk about self-defense immunity. We talk about consciousness of guilt uh, evidence, things not to do, especially in the aftermath of a use of force event, like drag him into the house before you call the police, that kind of nonsense. We talk about defense of property, all the many forms of property, highly defensible property like your home, your castle, uh, hotel rooms, RVs, tents, vehicles, and least defensible property like your stuff. And believe it or not, your pets are least defensible property. We talk about interacting with the police in the aftermath of a use of force event. We spend almost an hour on that alone. It's a much more subtle topic than you may think. Uh, there's a lot of value you could be leaving on the table. You could be leaving your whole defense on the table. If you simply follow the say nothing to the police approach, we explain why that is, and a more professional approach to interacting with the police, and much, much more all in one day, lawofselfdefense.com slash advanced. And this weekend is the last opportunity to save 50% off the regular registration. So check it out at lawofselfdefense.com slash advanced. All right. So before we dive into the um, defense motion to dismiss the grand jury indictment, let's see, make sure. Let me check my comments. Yeah, it's a Saturday bonus show. Looks like everything's okay. No one's complaining about audio or anything. I do want to refresh everyone's recollection on what we're talking about here. What 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 are the relevant legal issues here? Because the defense motion spends a lot of time talking about all this exculpatory evidence they claim to have that was not presented to the grand jury, they say, by the prosecution, even though the judge, uh, not actually this current judge, but the prior judge who'd been on this case, had ordered that the grand jury be presented with all available exculpatory evidence. But spoiler, a lot of what the defense calls exculpatory evidence is only exculpatory in their minds. It's not actually legally exculpatory because it's not legally relevant to any legal question in the case. It's just things that the defense thinks, well, maybe this would foster sympathy for our client. But unless the evidence under discussion actually would tend to negate one of the elements of the criminal charge or tend to support an explicit legal defense to be raised at trial, it's not legally relevant. And it's not exculpatory evidence in any legal sense of the term. So what are the relative legal elements here? Well, what does the state have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt for the jury on the law and evidence to return a verdict of guilty, that Alec Baldwin is guilty of the involuntary manslaughter of Helena Hutchins. Let me let me share it here. This is from a, a, a blog post I did soon after this event. By the way, you can find all our blog post content uh, on the Baldwin case if you just use the uh, shortcut URL. Let me change the, the uh, banner here for that purpose. 
I'm sure I must have set up a banner for this. But it's lawofselfdefense.com slash Baldwin. Here it is. Right there in the bottom of the screen. Lawofselfdefense.com slash Baldwin. Uh, because this is a case of public interest, we've aggregated all our videos and blog posts on this. Uh, you can find them all there. From, from the day after this shooting happened, we've been covering this case. And of course, we'll continue all the way through the uh, live streaming of the trial as well. When that happens in July, lawofselfdefense.com slash Baldwin. That's all freely accessible to everybody. So what does the prosecutor have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt? That first, first, Alec Baldwin pointed the muzzle of what he knew to be a real gun <coughs> directly at Helena Hutchins. Well, obviously, we know that's true because the bullet that was fired from that muzzle directly impacted Helena Hutchins. Clearly, the muzzle was pointed at her. Second, that Alec Baldwin pressed the trigger in a manner designed to fire the gun, in this particular case with the hammer cocked. We know that's true because when the gun was sent for FBI testing, it was impossible to fire the gun without the trigger being depressed. Third, that Alec Baldwin failed to first ensure that there was no live ammo in the gun. We know that's true because there was a bullet in there that fired. And the result was that the intended dis the unintended discharge of the bullet hit Miss Hutchins and killed her. We know that's true. These are the only things that Special Prosecutor Kerry Morrissey has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. There's lots of other things that people talk about. Like, well, it wasn't Alec Baldwin's fault to check the gun. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. In fact, New Mexico law explicitly doesn't care. Does not care. New Mexico Supreme Court. It, this is a different case, of course, but it involved someone who claimed I didn't know the gun was loaded and was convicted of involuntary manslaughter and said, no, that's wrong. I can't be convicted. I didn't know the gun was loaded. Just like Alec Baldwin is saying, I, I, I didn't know the gun was loaded. What does the New Mexico Supreme Court have to say about that? They say, it could have made no difference to the trial of a charge of involuntary manslaughter as to who loaded the gun. All that is necessary to establish for involuntary manslaughter by the use of a loaded firearm is that a defendant, Alec Baldwin, had in his hands a gun which at some time had been loaded and that he handled it without due caution and circumspection and that death resulted. Bam! So unless the state has... Uh, sorry, unless the defense has exculpatory evidence that goes to one of these four elements, and they really can't, res ipsa loquitur, the thing speaks for itself, all of this demonstrably happened, or unless the defense had evidence um, that asserted a defense, so even if this is true, he still had a defense, like you could imagine, well, suddenly Helena Hutchins lost her mind and came at Alec Baldwin with a machete, well, then he shot her in self-defense. But of course, that's not at play here. So when we read through the defense motion and they're saying all, we have this exculpatory evidence. It's not exculpatory evidence in any legal sense of that word because it does not negate, tend to negate any of the elements of the crime. And it doesn't go to a legal defense, a raisable legal defense. It's just when they say exculpatory, what they mean is sympathetic, emotionally sympathetic. That's what I expect we'll see as we read through the defense motion. All right, let me, now I have to find it. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Here it is. Over here. Let's switch this over. Oh, uh, wait a minute. That's not what I wanted. Let me try again. I put that into a Word document, but we I think I have the uh, the actual more formal looking document. Okay, I do. All right. So hopefully that's readable for everybody. <clears throat> so the case, of course, is State of New Mexico versus Alexander Ray Baldwin III, who we know as Alec Baldwin. Defendant, Alec Baldwin's motion to dismiss the indictment. Now, I, th I think Baldwin has like eight or ten, maybe more, lawyers now working on this case. All of them are from out of state, out of New Mexico, except for one. You have to have one local attorney, so they've retained one local attorney. That's Heather LeBlanc here. 
she's got a very good reputation in New Mexico. She uh, has been, or or maybe is, it must have been has been before she went into private practice, uh, the head of the public defender's uh, felony division, um, which would be a tremendous place to get a ton of experience and expertise in defending felony cases. I've only ever heard good things about her. Carrie Morrissey mentions um, attorney LeBlanc in her response to this motion and says good things about her. Uh, but all the other lawyers are pro hack Vici, meaning they're from out of state and they're being given permission by the trial court to participate under the umbrella of local attorney Heather LeBlanc. One wonders, given special prosecutor Kerry Morrissey's response, whether that permission might be rescinded. We'll have to see. We will have to see. All right. Uh, table of contents. I'll skip over that. Uh, table of authorities, blah, 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 blah. Okay, defendant Alec Baldwin, by and through undersigned counsel, meaning as a defense counsel, respectfully moves to dismiss the indictment under New Mexico statute. Preliminary statement. Nothing is more central to our system of justice than a fair and impartial jury. As Thomas Jefferson put it, trial by jury is the only anchor ever yet imagined by man by which government can be held to the principles of its constitution. So too for the grand jury. Quote, the grand jury is our system's foundation for the protection of individual rights and a recognized method by which the public can be certain of protection against abuse of public responsibilities. Close quote. And they cite a New Mexico Supreme Court decision. The prosecutors obtained the indictment against Alec Baldwin by circumventing this fundamental protection over and over and over again. This is a claim of profound misconduct by the prosecutors in this case, some of whom have been removed from the case. Um, we'll get into that in a moment. But also Carrie Morrissey, who's now the special prosecutor on this case. The criminal case against Baldwin started in January 2023 when the Wall Street Journal called Baldwin's attorneys to inform them for the first time that Alec Baldwin was being prosecuted for involuntary manslaughter. Does that matter that they say they heard about this from the Wall Street Journal and were not contacted directly by the prosecutor? No, doesn't matter. Immediately after, the state announced the decision publicly and went on a viral press tour to tell the world that Baldwin was guilty and faced a mandatory minimum five-year prison sentence. The state's approach came by surprise. The state had promised to inform Baldwin well in advance of making such a decision. Are they required to do that? No. It also posted on Facebook the day before that it would be making a somber and respectful announcement of its charging decision without making any public appearances. It broke these promises. Now, first, those prosecutors are no longer involved in this case, and were not involved in this indictment. They were involved in an earlier indictment that was dismissed. Second of all, are prosecutors bound by any of this? Are they bound to make a somber and respectful announcement or even bound by a promise to do that? No. Continuing, the state's unethical disparagement of Alec Baldwin. Well, obviously they believe he's guilty of the crime or they wouldn't have indicted him. Of Alec Baldwin was a sign of things to come. The state violated the ex post facto clauses of the U.S. and New Mexico Constitution by charging Baldwin with a firearm enhancement that had not been enacted when the accident occurred. This is true, by the way. So the original indictment included both the involuntary manslaughter and a firearm sentencing enhancement that would have increased the maximum sentencing to five years from 18 months. But that sentencing enhancement statute was put into effect after this shooting event. And it can't apply retroactively. So it was wrongfully brought against Alec Baldwin and rightfully dismissed. But when that was dismissed, that cured this fault. The district attorney, Mary Carmack Altweiss, appointed special prosecutor Andrea Reeb to pursue Baldwin. And this neither one of these people is any longer involved with this case or this indictment. Even though she... Andrea Reeb was simultaneously running for a seat in the New Mexico legislature, and that happens not to be allowed. Guess, guess what they did with this problem? The state. They cured it. They took Andrea Reeb off the case. And they dismissed the indictment she was involved in. 
Reeb told Carmack Altweiss in a private email exchange that she wanted Carmack Altweiss to announce her involvement in the prosecution because it would help her election campaign, writing LOL at the idea of minting her political career in the Republican Party by knocking down Alec Baldwin. Well, New Mexico's very liberal state. But even if all this were true, neither one of these people is involved in this case or this indictment. When Baldwin filed motions challenging the state's unconstitutional conduct, the state withered. Did they wither? Or did they say, you know what? You're right. We did this wrong. We're removing all the wrong stuff. We're going to start over. Carmark Altweiss dismissed the firearm enhancement, which was the proper thing to do, and Reeb resigned from the prosecution, which was the proper thing to do. They cured those faults. Publicly, however, the state disparaged Baldwin and his counsel to divert attention from their misconduct and elementary legal mistakes. Well, they conceded the legal mistakes and they cured them. Calling Baldwin's counsel fancy big city lawyers who cared about nothing more than billable hours. The world was appalled. Was it? Was the world appalled? <laughs> you ever heard any of this happening? Any surprise that small town New Mexico lawyers might, might get snotty with the Big Wall Street firm lawyers. New York City. <laughs> Remember that? What was that? A uh, salsa or chili advertisement? New York City. And prominent judges, attorneys, and scholars uniformly criticized the merits of the state's case against Baldwin. Did they? Did they? Does that matter? Does that change what the law is or what the evidence is in this case? That they got a, a bunch of highfalutin scholars and attorneys, friends of Alec Baldwin, and, and others to say, we don't think this case has merit. Did they even look at New Mexico law? We just did. Is it that hard to understand? Four elements the state has to prove to secure a conviction on felony involuntary manslaughter, and they're all demonstrably proven by the obvious evidence. Continuing, Carmack Altweiss resigned shortly after Prosecutor Reeb and appointed Special Prosecutors Kerry Morrissey and Jason Lewis who prosecuted um, Hannah Gutierrez and are moving forward with the prosecution of Alec Baldwin. For a moment, things were different. Morrissey and Lewis dismissed the case against Baldwin in April 2023. After Baldwin's counsel proved to them accurately that the gun was modified and that the state had overlooked dozens of legal issues and facts. These are just blanket claims, right? Now, some people might read this and say, Wow, that's shocking. That's shocking. It, it's been proven that the gun was modified? And the state overlooked dozens of legal issues and facts that are material to this case? Folks, none of that is true. This is all smoke and mirrors by the defense, as we'll see in Kerry Morrissey's response. It's all nonsense. Remember, when you read this motion, you're only hearing one side of the argument. And anytime you hear one side of the argument, it always sounds compelling. We'll get to hear the other side of the argument when we get to Kerry Morrissey's response. The summer passed without event because the prosecutors were doing their due diligence on the case. Then in October 2023, more than two years after the accident, was it an accident? Mm, no, not so much. It looks a lot like involuntary manslaughter. Accident is a legal term of art. There is a legal defense of accident. But legal defense of accident requires no wrongdoing by the actor. By the actor I, here, I would mean the defender. I don't mean in a movie sense. I mean the, the person engaged in the allegedly criminal conduct. This was no accident. They'd love to believe it was, but it's not. Not when you're handling an inherently dangerous instrument, pointed at a woman, cocked the hammer, pressed the trigger without ensuring there's not live ammo in the gun and kill her. That's not an accident. That's involuntary, reckless manslaughter, every day of the week and twice on Sundays. Continuing, then in October 2023, more than two years after the accident and six months after Baldwin thought this wrongful prosecution was behind him, ha <laughs> ha, the case came back again. Morrissey announced her intention to present the case against Baldwin to a grand jury, as well as the November 16th, 2023 date of the presentation in an interview with the New York Times. She made false statements about the evidence and Baldwin's guilt in that article as well. Another claim of grotesque misconduct by Special Prosecutor Carrie Morrissey to misrepresent 
evidence, make false statements about evidence, that's misleading the court and the grand jury as well. That's sanctionable. That's what they're accusing her of. A few weeks later, Morrissey served a target notice on Baldwin from which she removed the 48-hour deadline for the submission of Baldwin's grand jury alert letter to shorten Baldwin's time to prepare the letter. So let me explain a few things here. So a target notice is when you notify someone that uh, charges against them will be presented to a grand jury. And the alert letter is something the target can prepare to have shown to the grand jury presenting essentially his side of the story. Uh, there's no evidence here that, first of all, there's no mandatory 48 hour deadline. Uh, second of all, they had more than 48 hours. Third of all, um, the intent being attributed here is pure mind reading. Morrissey admitted to Baldwin's counsel she had never seen this deadline removed, but then stated illogically that she had just wanted to ensure that Baldwin was being treated like everyone else. In fact, Morrissey had served a target notice on Hannah Gutierrez Reed the same day that included the 48 hour deadline that Morrissey removed from Baldwin's notice. This whole 48 hour thing is nonsense because they submitted an alert letter, and that alert letter, the defense did, and that alert letter was presented to the grand jury. So what does it matter whether or not there was a technical deadline notice not included? It caused no material harm. The grand jury still received the defense alert letter. At the same time, Morrissey was attempting to tilt that playing field. She also made the unprecedented request to unilaterally voir dire the grand jury. Is it unprecedented? Is it unlawful? Do these lawyers from New York know? The court denied the state's frivolous request and moved the grand jury date from November 2023 to January 2024. So even if Morrissey had made the unprecedented request to unilaterally voir dire the grand jury, even if that's true, it doesn't matter because the court didn't allow it. So it never actually happened. And the court gave months more time before the grand jury was going to be hearing this case. It also expressed, the court also expressed concern that the grand jury date and facts about the grand jury process had been disclosed to the New York Times, for which the state was solely responsible. The court noted the prejudicial nature of these disclosures. In this very case, the court ex explained, a member of the sitting grand jury had asked the court if he could sit on the grand jury that would hear Baldwin's case. Now, even if this is true, because you don't want people self-selecting for a grand jury, right? They may be there for, for bad motive, either to help the state or help the defense inappropriately. So you want the selection of the grand jury to be a more or less random process. You certainly don't want to seat someone who's asking to be seated. And here, someone asked to be seated. Guess what material harm resulted? None, because this person was not seated on the grand jury. Not the Alec Baldwin grand jury. Continuing, the court therefore ordered the parties to refrain from disclosing anything about the grand jury process to the press while the process was ongoing. Within one hour, however, Morrissey violated the court's order by disclosing the content of that hearing to the press, including the new grand jury date, even after the court admonished her about the serious prejudice that could arise out of precisely that disclosure. Here's what they don't tell you, but we'll see when we see Carrie Mor Morrissey's response. Carrie Morrissey spoke to the press only after the defense had publicly spoken to the press. And the prosecutor is supposed to be quiet and not talk to the press unless it's in response to defense misrepresentation to the media. Then the prosecutor can speak to the press to correct those misrepresentations, which is what happened here. Baldwin therefore filed a sanctions and contempt motion which prompted Morrissey to violate the court's order a second time because she also disclosed the contents of that motion to the press. Well, the motion isn't a grand jury hearing. That's a public record, the sanctions motion. So she's allowed to talk about that. And again, she's acting in response to the defense. Baldwin next submitted an alert letter identifying significant exculpatory and favorable witnesses and documents. So they claim, right? But we've already talked about that. Just because they think it's exculpatory and favorable doesn't mean it goes to the legal elements of the case or any defense. As well as jury instructions on the relevant offense and defenses. What they don't say here is that the defense crafted jury instructions that are inconsistent 
with the New Mexico standard jury instructions on involuntary manslaughter. Why, why would the defense do that? Because the actual standard jury instructions for involuntary manslaughter in New Mexico cook Alec Baldwin's goose. They cannot allow him to go to trial if the, if the actual involuntary manslaughter jury instructions are going to be used because he's done on the face, just like we talked about it. So they submitted modified jury instructions that would provide an escape hatch for their client. But those modified jury instructions don't reflect actual New Mexico law. So they submitted these jury instructions that they like, but don't reflect New Mexico law. They continue, but the state refused to present nearly any of that evidence to the grand jury, supporting its position with old case law. <laughs> Is case law invalid because it's old? No that had been overruled by the New Mexico Supreme Court and New, Mex and New Mexico statutory law. Yeah, I don't think any of that's true. What they might be doing is pointing at cases. Sometimes the case is reversed on certain elements and not other elements. And the one it's not reversed on remain valid law. The state also refused to read Baldwin's proposed charging instructions. That's the jury instruction we just talked about to the grand jury, noting it would read a different instruction about intervening cause even though the state's preferred instruction stated that it did not apply in homicide cases and would not read an instruction about involuntary manslaughter that deviated from the uniform jury instructions, the standard jury instructions. The reason they didn't read the proposed jury instructions is because they're, they're not actual New Mexico jury instructions. The reason they didn't read the intervening cause language the defense asked for is because the defense actually presented language that talked about preceding causes intervening causes, not subsequent intervening causes. There can be no preceding intervening cause. The whole point of intervening cause being a defense is that you did some action that could create legal liability, but no harm would have resulted but for someone else doing something first in intervening subsequent act. So <clears throat> I don't know what that would be here. Uh, maybe Alec Baldwin cocks the hammer, presses the trigger, and Assistant Director David Hall mentally moves a bullet into the chamber of the gun so that it fires. I mean, there, there's no possibility. There is no time for an intervening cause here between the moment the gun is discharged and the bullet strikes Elena Hutchins. Uh, let's see. The state, therefore, uh, the prosecution filed a motion seeking permission to disregard Baldwin's alert letter because it was full of nonsense. The court denied the state's motion with respect to the evidence. The court ordered the state to make nearly all the favorable evidence and witnesses available to the grand jury. Guess what actually happened? It was all made available to the grand jury. It was offered to the grand jury members. It turns out they decided they weren't interested in looking at it, but it was made available. Continuing now, as for the jury instruction, the court ordered the state to provide Baldwin's requested instruction on the issue of intervening cause if the evidence supported it, which it did not. And the court ruled that the state's instruction about involuntary manslaughter must precisely track the uniform jury instructions. Well, the uniform jury instructions were the ones being presented by the state. It was the modified ones that were not the uniform jury instructions that were offered by the defense. And that's why the defense instructions were not put to the grand jury. The court's ruling came just days before the grand jury presentation was set to start, which given the grand jury schedule left only two days for the state to present the entire case before the grand jury's term expired. Now, this is more slate of hand. The state presented their entire case. They didn't present the defense entire case because the defense case was full of stuff that was irrelevant to the legal issues in this trial. Baldwin warned the state in writing that it would not have enough time to present the evidence from his alert letter, which was irrelevant, before the term ended. And he asked the state to adjourn the grand jury date to ensure his irrelevant evidence could be presented. But the state ignored Baldwin's letter and jammed through its presentation in barely more than one day. As we'll hear from Kerry Morrissey's response, they, the state here spent a day and a half presenting to the grand jury on a fourth degree felony. You know how long New Mexico prosecutors typically spend on a case before the grand jury on a first-degree murder case? Less than three hours. 
a little bit of context there. So Morrissey spent like five times as much time in this fourth degree felony as is typically spent on a murder trial before the grand jury. The state did so doing jamming through its presentation in barely more than one day by violating nearly every rule in the book. Really? More accusations of grotesque professional misconduct this time lodged against special prosecutor Kerry Morrissey. They violated nearly every rule in the book. Let's see what these were. It did not explain the meaning or purpose of Baldwin's alert letter to the grand jury. It did not tell the grand jurors that they had the right and, in fact, the obligation to request and hear all exculpatory evidence. Uh, I'm going to skip internal quotes here just in the interest of time. The state did not make Baldwin's witnesses available to testify, the irrelevant witnesses, nor did it present the exculpatory and favorable evidence to the grand jury, the irrelevant evidence. And by the way, the fact that they didn't present it doesn't mean that it wasn't made available to the grand jury. It was made available. The grand jury just wasn't interested in looking at it. When grand jurors asked questions about exculpatory witnesses or facts, the state instead forced them to hear answers from the state's chosen and usually paid witnesses. Yes, because the grand jury was asking about irrelevant witnesses or facts. Or, or witnesses or facts unqualified to answer the questions being posed. Continuing, even when those witnesses had no personal knowledge or foundation for giving testimony about the subject. We'll see about that. And to top it all off, the state read the grand jury an involuntary manslaughter instruction that violated the court's order, unfairly stacked the deck against Baldwin, and contained language that was inconsistent with both the uniform jury instruction and the state's own opposition to Baldwin's request for a different instruction. Yeah, well, they're not going to give Baldwin's request for a different instruction because it's not New Mexico law. And we'll see about all this other stuff. Continuing, the state prosecutors have engaged in this misconduct, explicitly calling Kerry Morrissey engaged in misconduct, and publicly dragged Baldwin through the cesspool created by their improprieties without any regard for the fact that serious criminal charges have been hanging over his head for two and a half years. Boo-hoo-hoo! Boo-hoo-hoo! I love it that the state, that the defense rather simultaneously complains that uh, all of this is taking too long. And also, it's not going fast enough. Continuing, the defense says, enough is enough. This is an abuse of the system, and a, an abuse of an innocent person whose rights have been trampled to the extreme. The court should dismiss the indictment. <coughs> Factual background. The initial prosecution and its dismissal. You know what, folks? I'm going to skip all of this. You know why? Because it doesn't matter. However defective, the initial prosecution, the initial prosecutors, and the initial indictment might have been, they were all dismissed. They were all dismissed. They were all wiped off the slate. So no harm resulted. It's all irrelevant. The only thing relevant now I mean, the defense is not asking the already dismissed grand jury indictment to be dismissed. It's already gone. They're asking the current grand jury indictment to be dismissed. So that's the only one that matters here. All this stuff that was done away with, the guns, the inappropriate gun sentencing enhancement charge, uh, the uh, prosecutor who was running for legislative office, um, all this other stuff, the, Anything referring to the first indictment and the first prosecutors is utterly irrelevant. Six months, part two here, six months after dismissing all charges against Baldwin, the state pursues an indictment. Is the state allowed to do that? Sure, especially when it's a new prosecutor on the case. Kerry Morrissey had now been appointed. On October 5th, 2023, Morrissey informed Baldwin that she would present the case to a grand jury. That same day, the New York Times published an article revealing that Morrissey had conducted an interview with the Times about the case in which she improperly disclosed details about her intention to present the case to a grand jury, yet another disclosure that violated basic rules governing grand jury secrecy. Again, unless it was in response to the defense going in front of the press. Anybody remember Alec Baldwin's interview by George Stephanopoulos? 
The state is allowed to respond to that. The article explained the prosecution's view that evidence about the gun contradicted Mr. Baldwin's assertion that he had not pulled the trigger. That was in the Stephanopoulos interview. By the way, that was the first time he'd ever said that, to my knowledge, was in that interview with Stephanopoulos. I, I never pulled the trigger. Uh, quoting Morrissey's statement that, quote, the forensic testing of the gun concluded with certainty that the trigger of the gun had to have been pulled for the gun to go off, close quote. The article further reported that Morrissey, quote, said the prosecutors intend to bring, begin presenting the case to a grand jury on November 16th, raising the serious risk, which came true, that sitting grand jurors would read the press, be tainted by it, and actively seek to be assigned to Baldwin's case. And that maybe is all true, but guess what? The court pushed back the date for the grand jury. A new grand jury was impaneled, so there was no harm by any of this. Three, the state attempts to rig the process ahead of the grand jury. Special prosecutors file two unprecedented motions, one to limit Baldwin's time to submit an alert letter and the other to seek permission to voir dire the grand jury. Um, so in any criminal proceeding, folks, there are time limits. Otherwise, the defense would simply drag out a prosecution for decades and the suspect would never be held legally accountable. So all legal proceedings have time limits, time constraints. Sorry, folks, checking, got to check my email real quick. Give me one second. All right. Continuing, on October 25th, 2023, a week after improperly announcing the grand jury date to the public, Morrissey and Lewis, the special prosecutors here, served a target notice on Baldwin that omitted the standard 48-hour deadline for the target to provide a grand jury alert letter, even though they simultaneously acknowledged never having seen that provision omitted before. Does this omission matter, folks? Only if it results in harm. Did it result in harm here, or did they have months to prepare and submit an alert letter that was in fact presented to the grand jury? The answer is the latter. After admitting that she had eliminated the standard provision from the target letter, Morrissey stated she was nonetheless happy to work with Baldwin's counsel in this regard and will fully consider any requests made by Baldwin's counsel, which she did. Further, although Morrissey said she intended to ask the grand jury judge to shorten the deadline for Baldwin to submit an alert letter from November 14th to November 10th, just a few weeks after Baldwin received the target notice. Remember, they're, now they're saying that we only had a few weeks to respond, but previously they were complaining this is hanging over his head for two and a half years. Which is it? Uh, Morrissey also asked whether that was agreeable and to let me know your thoughts. Does that mean that however they respond is binding on Morrissey? If they say, no, no, we want five years to prepare our alert letter, does Morrissey have to concede that? No, of course not. She's willing to listen and consider. Continuing, Baldwin responded, his lawyers responded, that at a minimum, he should receive the full time to submit an alert letter that he's entitled to under New Mexico law, especially given the volume of evidence and number of witnesses involved in this case. In addition, Baldwin stated that the grand jury date should be adjourned to, follow, to allow the state sufficient time to review the voluminous alert letter we will be submitting. In other words, we are going to be sending you an alert letter that's so full of hot garbage that, believe me, you're going to need years to work through this thing. Voluminous. They're telling her it's going to be voluminous. Remember, there's four, four legal elements to this criminal prosecution. That's it, folks. Not 400. There's four. And they're all supported by what happened in that church when Alec Baldwin fired that gun into Helena Hutchins. Continuing. In addition, Baldwin stated that the grand jury date should, uh, let's see, voluminous letter will be submitting to ensure this process is done properly the first time around. When the defense says the first time, they mean never. We never want this to happen. We never want this to go before a grand jury. 
Baldwin's lawyers believe this to be a reasonable and fair approach. Well, that's controlling then, because a prosecuting attorney is required to alert the grand jury to all lawful, competent, and relevant evidence that disproves or reduces a charge or accusation or that makes an indictment unjustified and that was in within the knowledge, possession, or control of the prosecuting attorney. Yeah, that's true. But how much of what the defense wanted to submit in their alert letter was relevant evidence? Almost none of it. None of it. Um, <clears throat> there is a significant volume of evidence in this case, and it doesn't say relevant evidence, and the consequences of any failure to present exculpatory evidence are severe. Baldwin's attorneys therefore asked Morrissey if she was willing to discuss a reasonable schedule for this process. Reasonable to who? To the defense. Although Morrissey expressed a willingness to work with Baldwin's counsel in this regard and discuss a schedule that was agreeable to Baldwin, Morrissey immediately rejected Baldwin's request and stated that Baldwin was not entitled to additional time to submit requests that certain evidence witnesses be presented to the grand jury because she can see they're unjustly just dragging their heels. Morrissey also claimed that the state intended to treat Mr. Baldwin not differently than similarly situated defendants in New Mexico, even though she had just admitted that she'd never seen a target treated that way. Now they're talking again about this 48-hour notice thing that caused no harm. In fact, the special prosecutors already had treated Baldwin differently. On the same day they served the target notice on Baldwin, they also served the target notice on Hannah Gutierrez Reed. But the target notice Morrissey served on Gutierrez Reed contained the 48-hour deadline that Morrissey had intentionally deleted from Baldwin's letter, which therefore gave Gutierrez Reed four days more than Baldwin to submit exculpatory material. Two and a half years ago, this event happened, folks. Does anybody need four additional days to submit exculpatory material? Their client's already been indicted by a grand jury once, facing the same criminal charge. Anybody think the exculpatory material, if any, is ambiguous or hard to find? On October 30th, 2023, the state filed an expedited motion to shorten Baldwin's time to present exculpatory evidence by four days. In its motion, the state falsely, falsely, more misconduct alleged against Morrissey, represented that it had provided Baldwin continuous access to its investigative file since April 2023 when the previous prosecution was dismissed and argued that in any event, Baldwin didn't need the full statutory period to provide exculpatory evidence because he was already well aware of all possible directly exculpatory evidence today. And that's true, as a matter of fact. It just doesn't include the quote-unquote exculpatory evidence the defense thinks is exculpatory, but which as a technical legal matter is irrelevant. Beyond that, the state expressed concern that Baldwin would intentionally withhold the requested exculpatory evidence until exactly 48 hours prior to the grand jury to cause the postponement of the grand jury proceeding. As Baldwin explained, the state's position was backwards. Baldwin was entitled to submit an alert letter up to 48 hours before the grand jury proceeding. And all the state had to do to alleviate its self-imposed time crunch was adjourn its unreasonably accelerated schedule for the grand jury process. Further, as Baldwin explained, the state's argument made no sense. The purported fact that Baldwin had access to a massive number of files would support giving him more time to review the documents and draft an alert letter, not less. The only plausible inference to be drawn from the state's approach and the fact that Gutierrez Reed was being afforded the rights that Baldwin was being denied is that the state wanted to make it harder for Baldwin to alert the grand jury to relevant and exculpatory evidence. Except none of that ever happened. In parallel with this unprecedented effort to shorten Baldwin's time to submit an alert letter, the state also made an unprecedented request to conduct a one-sided voir dire of the grand jury. The purported reason for the state's request was to control for the significant amount of information, some of it inaccurate or incomplete, being made available to prospective jurors through the media. The state's talking about the Stephanopoulos interview in part here, right? What the state's motion failed to acknowledge, however, is that the media environment surrounding the incident, particularly the coverage most prejudicial to Baldwin, was primarily the result of the state's own unethical press campaign. 
Well, no, the grand jury is allowed to be voir about any bias, either against the defendant or against the state. On November 9th, 2023, the court heard argument regarding the state's attempt to limit Baldwin's right to submit in an alert letter up to 48 hours before the grand jury and the state's request to voir dire the grand jury. The court denied both motions. So what are they bitching about? They spend all this time writing about this 48-hour notice and the state's wish to voir dire the grand jury, and none of that happened. It never happened. There can have been no harm. What a bunch of whiny bitches. On November 14th, 2023, 48 hours before the grand jury was scheduled to begin, Baldwin submitted an alert letter to the state that identified several key witnesses and dozens of documents that would disprove the charges against Baldwin or otherwise make an indictment unjustified. Specifically, the alert letter identified the following witnesses whose testimony would be exculpatory or favorable to Baldwin's case. So when we look at these people, remember, remember, these are the elements of the criminal charge that Carrie Morrissey has to prove be, to the jury, to their satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt, that Alec Baldwin pointed the muzzle at Helena Hutchins, indisputable that he pressed the trigger in the manner designed to fire the weapon. Indisputable. That he failed to first ensure that the weapon did not contain a live round. Indisputable. And that that bullet killed Hutchins. Indisputable. So when we look at these points, not only are they indisputable from the uncontestable evidence at trial, from the event itself, how, how would anything these witnesses have to say change any of that? Joel Souza. Well, he was primarily responsible for all creative aspects of the film and relied on the entire cast and crew to bring his creative vision to life. What, what does that have to do with the involuntary manslaughter charge? He was present in the church during the rehearsal and was struck by the fatal bullet after a pass through Helena Hutchins. So? The alert letter stated that Souza's testimony would make clear that responsibility for firearm safety lies with the armorer and first assistant director not with actors, <clears throat> and that Mr. Baldwin did not act negligently on set. Well, Sousa doesn't get to just pass legal judgment on what's negligent or not. In any case, the legal standard here is recklessness, not negligence, recklessness. And Sousa doesn't get to express an opinion on that either. That's for the jury to decide. None of this other stuff changes any of the criminal elements against Baldwin in that involuntary manslaughter charge. David Halls, the assistant director, first assistant director. Halls was in charge of managing and supervising all departments and for safety conditions on the set. Moreover, Halls is aware of the conditions on set and the day of the incident and was pr present in the church when the fatal charge discharged. Okay. The alert letter stated that Hall's testimony would establish that responsibility for firearm safety lies with the armorer and the first assistant director, not with actors. First of all, that's contrary to SAG guidelines. Safety is everyone's responsibility. Actors are instructed in those guidelines to never point a gun at anybody, including themselves, and never touch the trigger unless they intend the gun to fire. In any case, none of that is superior to New Mexico state law on involuntary manslaughter. So there's nothing David Halls can say that would change any of the elements or the evidence on those elements. Sarah Zachary. Sarah Zachary was Russ's prop master, responsible for acquiring, placing, and overseeing any props needed, including prop firearms and ammunition. As prop master, Zachary oversaw and supervised the armor. <coughs> Hannah Gutierrez Reed. I was the only other person on set with the responsibility for the safe storage and handling of firearms and ammunition. No, everybody handling a gun under New Mexico law is responsible for safe handling of that gun. Negligent handling of a firearm is a crime under New Mexico law. Recklessly handling a gun without due care and circumspection and causing a death is involuntary manslaughter under New Mexico law. There's nothing Sarah Zachary might testify to that changes any of that. Ryan Smith was a producer of the film. So he was one of the money guys, the financiers of this film. Think he was happy to get Alec Baldwin as the lead on the film? 
that's what was required for this movie to have any chance of making money, getting a return on his investment. The alert letter stated that Smith's testimony would establish that Baldwin did not have responsibility for selection or hiring of crew or for the day-to-day -day operation of the production. <coughs> Baldwin's not charged with poor management of the production. And that Baldwin did not act negligently. Again, that's not for a financier to say. That's for the jury to decide. Smith's testimony would undercut the state's producer theory of liability. In other words, that Baldwin has liability here because he was a producer on the on the set. He's not being charged under producer liability. He's. It's not like somebody else shot and killed Helena Hutchins and they're going after Alec Baldwin criminally because he was a producer. That's not what's happening here. They're going after Alec Baldwin because he had the gun in his hand. He had the gun in his hand when it discharged and killed Helena Hutchins. There is no state producer theory of liability. In fact, he would confirm that Baldwin wasn't on set or even in the state of New Mexico for most of the filming that was done leading up to the accident. What's what's that relevant to in terms of this involuntary manslaughter charge? It, does, it only matters, was he, was he sitting in that pew with the gun in his hand? Irrelevant. Detective Alexandria Hancock, a Santa Fe Sheriff's detective who acted as the lead investigator on this case. Hancock's affidavits described dozens of exculpatory statements from numerous witnesses, as well as major gaps in the investigation and how evidence was gathered. Is any of that relevant to the four elements of involuntary manslaughter? No. The alert letter included 105 non-leading questions that would have elicited exculpatory testimony from Hancock. No, it would have elicited testimony from Hancock, like the investigation could have been done better. Fair enough. Doesn't change anything about the four elements of involuntary manslaughter. Detective Joel Cano, Santa Fe Sheriff's detective, acted as one of the investigators. Again, he's, he's going to be questions about the same stuff. The quality of the investigation, that doesn't change that Alec Baldwin shot and killed Helena Hutchins. Robert Schilling, an investigator for the state and was aware of deficiencies in the investigation, including leads that were not run down. What leads would, would be run down that would affect whether or not it was Alec Baldwin who shot and killed Helena Hutchins? What lead could possibly exist? In addition to those witnesses, the alert letter identified 23 documents that Baldwin contended would disprove the charge against him or make an indictment unjustified. <clears throat> A recording of the 911 call where the caller, that's a crazy lady, lady, the script tracker, whatever her job title was. She called 911, said there was an accident. Is she a lawyer? Does she know the difference between accident and recklessness? It, it, is her judgment of what happened controlling on this case? Or does the jury decide whether or not it was an accident based on the law and evidence? Completely irrelevant. She doesn't get to make an ultimate finding of fact. Three search warrants containing numerous exculpatory statements from key witnesses, including statements from a cameraman that Baldwin had been very careful with firearms on the set. Well, until he shot and killed Helena Hutchins, which is what we're talking about here. A statement that Halls told everyone, including Baldwin, the gun was safe to handle before it went off. Doesn't matter what Hall said. The gun is in Baldwin's hands. He's responsible for it. A statement from Halls that he should have checked all the rounds. Well, sure, he had liability here, too. He took a plea to reckless handling or negligent handling of a firearm. Criminal conviction. Um, and a statement from Gutierrez Reed that she didn't really check the gun too much. And she got convicted of involuntary manslaughter. None of that has anything to do with the four elements of involuntary manslaughter against Alec Baldwin. A report from the New Mexico OSHA that demonstrated Baldwin was not part of set rust management and that his authority on set was limited to creative decisions. What's that got to do with the way he handled the gun? And OSHA, as they testified in the Gutierrez trial, doesn't seek to put responsibility on any individual. It only investigates organizations. Text messages between Zachary, Gutierrez Reed, and Seth Kenny, the film's ammunition supplier, which contain evidence that Gutierrez went target shooting with the driver of the prop truck. What's that got to do with anything that Alec Baldwin did? A letter signed by many of the cast and crew disputing that the set of rest was inherently unsafe. 
the whole set doesn't have to be inherently unsafe if Alec Baldwin, while handling a gun unsafely, shoots and kills Elena Hutchins. A transcript from David Hall's proffer interview in which he blames himself for the incident and states that no member of the cast or crew could have anticipated there would be live rounds in the firearm on the set. But you know what Alec Baldwin did do? He pointed what he knew to be a real gun at Elena Hutchins. He cocked the hammer. He pressed the trigger without ensuring there was no live ammo in the gun. And he shot and killed Helena Hutchins. Under New Mexico law, that's involuntary manslaughter every day of the week and twice on Sundays. Regardless of how David Halls feels about it. The alert, alert letter also requested the state provide specific instructions to the grand jury on two critical elements of the charging statute. <clears throat> First, Baldwin requested instruction that the criminal negligence standard requires the prosecution to show that Mr. Baldwin had subjective knowledge of an actual risk that the firearm placed in his hand had been loaded with live ammunition. Baldwin stated to police that he knew he was handling a real gun. If you know you're handling a real gun, there's always a risk. That real gun contains real ammo. Always. Uh, the, the defense is trying to say that the state would have to prove that Baldwin knew that the gun he was handling was likely loaded with live ammunition. No. No. He knows it could be un until you confirm it's not. Guns are presumed loaded until it's confirmed they are not. Especially if you're going to point them at a human being, pull back the hammer, and press the trigger. So that is not a required element. In fact, I showed you the New Mexico case law that says it doesn't matter how the gun got loaded. All that matters is the gun was, in fact, loaded. Second, Baldwin requested an instruction that proximate cause is an element of causation and that the element of proximate cause is negated where the negligence of a third party, someone other than Mr. Baldwin, was the only significant cause of death or constitutes an intervening cause that broke the foreseeable chain of events. So was the negligence of a third party present? Sure. Lots of people. David Hall, Hannah Gutierrez. Was, was their misconduct the only significant cause of death? Meaning, Alec Baldwin pointing the muzzle directly at Helena Hutchins, cocking the hammer and pressing the trigger. None of that was a significant cause of death. Ridiculous on its face. Or that the other per people's negligence constitutes an intervening cause that broke the foreseeable chain of events. There was no way to break the foreseeable chain of events between the moment that Alec Baldwin pointed the gun at Helena Hutchins, cocked the hammer, pressed the trigger, the gun discharged, and the bullet hit Helena Hutchins. There was no intervening cause that broke the foreseeable chain of that gun discharging and the bullet hitting Helena Hutchins. More nonsense. On November 15th, 2023, the state filed an expedited motion to preclude nearly all of the documents and witnesses that Baldwin identified in his alert letter. Yes, because they're irrelevant to the elements of the crime and they do not raise a legal defense. The state also sought to preclude Baldwin's requested jury instruction regarding subjective knowledge because it's nonsense, arguing that an instruction requiring that the target had substantive knowledge of an actual risk that the firearm placed in his hand <coughs> had been loaded with live ammunition is an unprecedented departure from the elements of proof the law and rules require. 100% correct. The state further argued that such an instruction improperly, by the way, and even, even of like, who, who would change that? Who would decide, no, we should change the standard instructions to require that, place that additional burden on the state? You know who would do that? The trial judge at trial. But he won't. She won't. The state further argued that such an instruction improperly assumes that the factual basis of a negligent act was failing to check the firearm for live rounds. That's not what the state's saying. The state doesn't care how the live round got in there. It only cared that it was in there. Now, the only way to make sure it wasn't in there would have been to check, which is what Alec Baldwin didn't do. But however, it would have been checked. If Alec Baldwin had just handed the gun off behind him and said, someone make sure this isn't loaded, and they gave him back the gun, and it turns out it didn't have a live bullet in it, and Helena Hutchins is not dead, then he didn't commit involuntary manslaughter. The problem is he didn't do anything 
to make sure there were no live rounds in the gun. According to the state, whether or not Baldwin had subjective knowledge of an actual risk that the firearm placed in his hand had been loaded with live ammunition has nothing to do with the other ways in which the state intends to show he negligently handled the firearm resulting in death. Correct. Pointing a gun you have not cleared at another human, cocking the hammer and pressing the trigger is all that's required for involuntary manslaughter. The defense is trying to add additional, <coughs> additional elements on the state to increase the burden on the state that simply don't exist in New Mexico law and ought not. <coughs> By the way, if Baldwin had known there was a substantial risk of a live round on the gun, he'd be charged with murder, not manslaughter. The state also refused to provide Baldwin's requested causation instruction. The state stated that it intended to pro pro provide a different instruction, even though and yet another legal blunder, the state's preferred instruction stated that it didn't apply in homicide cases. It doesn't matter. No, no intervening cause instruction is going to be applicable on the facts of this case. So even if it was error, it's harmless error. On November 15th, 2023, the court held a hearing to discuss the party's pending motions as well as the grand jury schedule. The court first stated that given the length and breadth of the state's motion to preclude Baldwin's requested evidence, the court was vacating and rescheduling the grand jury from November 16th to January 18th, 2024. So all this harm the defense is claiming they were facing because of the November 6th date, grand jury date, all got wiped out because it was rescheduled two months later, more than two months later. The court also postponed argument on the state's motion to give the court time to review the party's submissions. The exact solution that Baldwin had originally proposed to the state to ensure this process is done properly the first time around. And that's, in fact, what happened. So no harm. At the hearing, the court also expressed deep concern about the fact that the grand jury date and other information about the grand jury process had been disclosed to the media. The court explained that disclosing the grand jury date to the press, which the state did, created the risk of prejudice. Well, was there prejudice? And grand jurors had, in fact, approached the clerk seeking to serve on the grand jury. Well, did they? No. The court, therefore, unequivocally and repeatedly ordered the parties not to disclose information about the grand jury process or what happened during that day's hearing. The state violated the court's order within one hour by disclosing details of the hearing to the press. Again, we'll find out that was in response to the defense going to the press, including the new grand jury date that the court had instructed the parties not to disclose. Baldwin, therefore, filed a sanctions and contempt motion which prompted the state to violate the court's order again by making improper disclosures about those filings. As if the things couldn't get worse, in these discussions, the state also revealed its illicit motivations behind this prosecution. By the way, what happened with that sanctions and contempt motion? Was it granted? Or did the court conclude that sanctions and contempt were not warranted? Guess. As if things couldn't get worse in these discussions, the state also revealed its illicit motivation behind this prosecution. As reported in the article, by the way, what's reported in the article is not necessarily what the prosecution actually said, right? We all know how the media works. As reported in the article, quote, prosecutors haven't said publicly what new evidence they have obtained during their months of investigation, but a source familiar with the case said the special prosecutors have had discussions in which they said they hope the trial will humble Baldwin, specifically citing his run-ins with paparazzi and public comments that weren't about the case. The source added that the intention is for this to be a teachable moment for Baldwin, close quote. Where's the actual evidence that the prosecution said this? They're just quoting a news report. Quoting a news report, quoting an unstated named source, that's not the prosecutors. Triple hearsay. The following morning on the Today Show, the press added that the special prosecutor said they were also targeting Baldwin because they think he's arrogant. Who, who, what press? And that's not the prosecutors talking. This is double hearsay. This was a stunning and extreme abuse of prosecutorial power. <laughs> if it happened, consistent with the state's motivations from day one when the previous prosecutors no longer on the case um, said that prosecuting Baldwin would help their election chances. But they're gone. So no harm resulted from anything they said. 
See, the court orders the state to make virtually all of Baldwin's exculpatory evidence available to the grand jury. This is the question I started from the beginning, right? Well, what is exculpatory? Is it exculpatory because the defense says it is? Or is it only exculpatory if it actually tends to negate an element of the crime or raises a legal defense? The correct answer is B. Just because the defense says evidence is exculpatory doesn't mean it's exculpatory. It doesn't mean it's relevant to either the criminal charge or a legal defense. On January 11th, 2024, the court overruled most of the state's objections to Baldwin's evidence. Well, okay, so that's a win for Baldwin. No harm there to the defense. And held that the grand jury must be told about nearly all the evidence the state had sought to exclude. The January 11th order also rejected the state's narrow view of what it means to conduct a fair and impartial grand jury proceeding and provided the state with a roadmap to comply with its obligations. Still no harm before the grand jury. To begin with, the court explained that the state needs to facilitate the grand jury's inquiry into any lawful, relevant, and competent evidence not initially presented by the state and cannot unilaterally withhold evidence or witnesses requested by the grand jury. Requested by the grand jury. Special prosecutors were therefore obligated to alert the grand jury to any lawful, competent, and relevant evidence identified in Baldwin's alert letter that would disprove or reduce an accusation that goes to the elements of the criminal charge or make an indictment unjustified. Who says the prosecution didn't do this? Moreover, contrary to the state's inaccurate assertion that it was only required to present evidence that directly negates defendant's guilt, well, that is true. Which, adding to its mountains of legal errors, the state cited overruled law to support, the court confirmed that Baldwin's evidence need not be directly exculpatory to compel the state to alert the grand jury to its existence. Well, the, the state did. The state provided the grand jury with a box of this exculpatory evidence. The state didn't speak to it because in the state's view, it's irrelevant, but it did provide it to the grand jury. And then it's up to the grand jury to decide whether or not they want to look through that box. <clears throat> As the court noted, the intent of the law is to give the grand jury access to more evidence, not less. And the prosecution did that. You know, folks, I'm going to take a look at where we are. Let's see. All right, I'm not getting through this whole thing today. Sorry. I had forgotten how long this was. The The state's response is even longer. The state's response is not 60 pages like this, but, but 316 pages. But almost all of its exhibits, only about 30 pages, is a substantive. Uh, I'm going to go a few more pages, and then I'm going to have to break the show. I've been talking for an hour and a quarter already. My My, my voice is still recovering. Uh, continuing, applying these principles, the court ruled that all seven of Baldwin's proposed witnesses must be made available to the grand jury. Does that mean the state has to present them or just make them available? Hey, grand jury, if you'd like to talk to these people, we'll bring them in. You you have the right, actually, the grand jury has the right to subpoena witnesses. So these are witnesses the defense has suggested. If you want to hear from them, they, they can be brought here. It doesn't mean the state has to bring them on their own initiative. As for the documentary evidence, the court ruled in favor of Baldwin with respect to 20 out of the 21 documents that the state had sought to exclude. Okay, that's a win. This is only harmful if the state does not actually provide access to those documents to the grand jury, but they did. In a separate order issued the same day, the court cautioned the state it must provide Baldwin's requested proximate cause instruction if the evidence supports its provision to the grand jury. Guess what? It doesn't. The court disagreed with Baldwin, with the defense, however, that the state was required to instruct the grand jury that it was necessary to prove that Baldwin was subjectively aware that the gun he was handling was likely loaded with live ammunition. Accepting the state's argument that it was improper to require an instruction that is materially different from the relevant uniform jury instruction. So, 
the defense lost on this argument because the judge agreed with, with the state that you use the standard instructions, not this bullshit the defense put together. Uh, let's see. In other words, the state was required to track the uniform jury instructions precisely without importing any specific information about the nature of the target's duty of care to check the firearm. Well, they're not saying an obligation to check the firearm. For example, the defendant could avoid liability here. Alec Baldwin would avoid liability for involuntary manslaughter if he hadn't pointed the muzzle at Helena Hutchins, if he ha hadn't cocked the hammer, if he hadn't pressed the trigger. All of those are ways to avoid committing involuntary manslaughter that do not involve checking the firearm. So there isn't, per se, an explicit duty to check the firearm. There's an explicit duty not to engage in conduct without due care and circumspection that results in Helena Hutchins' death. The special prosecutors conduct a sham, a sham grand jury proceeding in violation of the court's orders and New Mexico law. Well, that's a, that's a big claim. Despite the court's order that the state had an obligation to act in a fair and impartial manner at all times during the grand jury proceedings, Morrissey and Lewis had a different agenda. As a starting point, the state intended to proceed with the grand jury on January 18th, even though the grand jury's term was set to expire on January 19th. And there is no way the state could present all the relevant evidence in that time frame. Again, is evidence relevant? because the defense says it's relevant? Or is it legally relevant only when it helps a jury decide the probability of whether a claimed fact is more or less true, a material fact? The answer is B. Therefore, on January 18th, 2024, Baldwin sent a letter to the special prosecutors expressing concerns about the special prosecutor's willingness and ability to comply with their obligations. Well, the, the state's obligations are not defined by the defense. Specifically, Baldwin's counsel stated that based on the numerous questions you asked the court about the logistics of completing this process within only two days, we are concerned that you will be unable or unwilling to present all the information in the alert letter or may attempt to circumvent your obligation to do so. Remember, they're only obligated to present relevant information in the alert letter. Not everything in the alert letter. If it's irrelevant, they're not obligated to present it. And therefore, they don't have an obligation to do so. So they're not circumventing an obligation. And what if the state's lying? You know what the check is on the state lying? The trial court decides. Can always vacate the grand jury indictment. Baldwin, therefore, reiterated that the state is required to present the alert letter in its entirety, which it did. It's literally a letter that was read to the grand jury. And to completely present any information the grand jury wishes to hear, meaning they want to hear it, regardless of when the grand jury's term expires. And that any effort to circ circumvent that obligation, including directly or implicitly encouraging the grand jury not to hear the information because it will prolong their term of service, would violate New Mexico law. There's zero evidence any of this happened. The letter requested that the state's presentation go before a new grand jury that has sufficient time to hear the necessary evidence, so a, a request for delay, and explicitly reserved Baldwin's right to seek to dismiss any charges that resulted from the state's failure to comply with the above obligations. Well, of course, you reserve all your rights all the time. I mean, that's what you're doing here, right? You're seeking to dismiss these charges, claiming that the state committed misconduct. In, in obtaining the indictment. The state ignored Baldwin's letter and conducted the grand jury proceedings in an expedited and unlawful manner. Unlawful. Who decides whether or not it was unlawful? The trial judge will decide. The state presents false and inaccurate testimony to the grand jury, another claim of misconduct against Carrie Morrissey. The state presented seven witnesses to the grand jury. Three are on the district attorney's payroll. All right, so, you know, two are from the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office, okay? One is suing Baldwin for money, all right? And another began blaming Baldwin in the media within days of Hutchins' death, even though he quit the production before the accident and was not on set when it occurred. What's that got to do with anything? Of the state's seven witnesses, only one, Ross Adiago, the one suing Baldwin for money, 
witnessed the accident. Well, the facts of the accident are uncontested. Alec Baldwin pointed what he knew to be a real gun at Helena Hutchins, cocked the hammer, pressed the trigger, a round discharged from that gun into Helena Hutchins and killed her. Um, and all this other stuff is irrelevant. It doesn't, it doesn't matter who these people work for if they have relevant testimony, testimony relevant to the elements of the criminal charge. And they do. That's all that matters. Uh, let's see. Alexandria Hancock. I'm not going to step through all these people's testimony. Uh, then there was, uh, I'll just, I'll just say their names. Let's see. Alexandria Hancock. She was a lead investigator. Um, well, they say after Hancock and Popple, where did they mention Popple? Oh, and Marissa Popple, a crime scene technician. We remember her, right? She processed evidence, took photos, I think. Um, after Hancock and Popple, the state called Michael Haig, we, we, uh, one of the state's purported firearms experts to testify that the firearm would not have fired on that day unless Baldwin pulled the trigger. Haig, who has no personal knowledge of the testing. Well, the only person who does is the FBI agent, but that's fine. He has the FBI agent's report. <clears throat> uh, summarize the testing conducted by the FBI. That's the report during which the firearm was beaten with a mallet and destroyed. Well, it wasn't destroyed. <laughs> a part broke. <clears throat> Without preserving any evidence of the condition when the accident occurred. No, there, there was evidence of the condition because the gun was operated prior to being broken. And how it operated is evidence of its condition. Uh, throughout his testimony, he referred to a video he prepared with the prosecution that depicted a different firearm from the one he had on set. Yes, a model firearm, uh, um, uh, um, an identical copy to the firearm in question, so he could demonstrate proper functioning. Haig admitted several essential facts regarding that testing. Well, he's not obligation, obligated. This is not the trial. This, the grand jury is not an adversarial process. He's not required to present the defense case. He's only required to present the evidence that's relevant to the criminal charges. So the fact that he didn't talk about stuff that the defense would have preferred him to talk about is irrelevant in front of the grand jury. That's why a grand jury does not decide guilt. That's why we move on from the grand jury to a petite jury, to a criminal trial. That is an adversarial process. I'm going to skip much of this because it's all irrelevant nonsense. Uh, it's claiming that the gun was modified uh, in some way, and that's what caused the gun to discharge. But we know that's not the case because the initial testing with the FBI before they broke the part the gun was operating normally would not fire without the trigger being depressed. The state's next witness was Brian Carpenter. Again, he's a paid expert witness. He was a uh, um, movie set armorer expert. He presents himself as an armor and weapons expert, but that, that is now how he presented himself to the grand jury. Well, he also does production work. That doesn't mean he doesn't have experience as an armorer. And he was qualified as an expert witness by this judge in the first trial, the Hannah Gutierrez trial. He introduced himself as the owner of a production studio that makes movies as if he started as an armorer, but has since taken on bigger roles. That testimony was false, and Prosecutor Morrissey knew it. Carpenter is not an experienced film producer. Well, he never claimed to be experienced. <coughs> Even the defense doesn't claim he claimed to be experienced. <coughs> In any case, his relevant expertise is not as a movie producer. It's as a film armorer. And in that area, he has extensive experience. Uh, the misrepresentation allowed Carpenter to testify well beyond his experience with credibility he didn't earn. For example, Carpenter told the grand jury that the safety bulletins issued by the Screen Actors Guild place responsibility for firearm safety on the actor. Well, they do. I mean, I've gone over the Screen Actors Guild. It's safety bulletin number one, the gun bulletin, the firearm safety bulletin. So important, it's literally number one of the safety bulletins. It says safety is everyone's responsibility, including the actor, and has specific guidance for the actor. Never point the gun at anybody. 
never put your finger on the trigger until you're ready to discharge the gun. That's all specific to the actor. In fact, the defense says SAG has made the opposite statement. And now what they're referring to is a press release that was released by SAG January 19th of, of 2023 after the shooting, after Alec Baldwin, a star in Hollywood, maybe a B star, but a star of sorts, uh, after he realized he was facing criminal liability for involuntary manslaughter, after everybody got copies of the SAG after firearm safety bulletin number one, and saw that the actor was responsible, SAG issued a press release saying, well, no, it's not really an actor's job to be a firearms or weapons expert. Well, first of all, even if it wasn't, it's still his job not to commit involuntary manslaughter under New Mexico law. In fact, by the way, the SAG firearm safety bulletin number one explicitly says this does not take superiority over state law. And the firearms bulletin makes clear that the actor has no obligation to check the gun. It says don't point the gun at anybody. Don't press the trigger unless you want the gun to discharge. So this is all obfuscation. The next witness was Lane Looper, a member of the Russ camera crew who quit the production the day before the fatal accident. Despite his absence from the set on the day of the accident and his relatively narrow role as an assistant cameraman, Morrissey treated him as an expert on all things related to film safety. Well, was he experienced on film sets and therefore would have gotten uh, bulletins on firearm safety on sets? He would have been around guns on sets? I mean, that that's sufficient basis for his expertise on that subject. What else? Morrissey's presentation to the grand jury included just a single witness, a single eyewitness to the accident, a crew member named Ross Adiago. Neither Morrissey nor Adiago disclosed to the grand jury, however, that Adiago is suing Baldwin for money damages. Doesn't matter. How, how does that change Baldwin's conduct? Now, it, you may say, well, it impeaches Adiago's credibility, but the material facts in this case that support involuntary manslaughter are not dependent on Adiago's testimony. They're proven by the events themselves. The state's final witness, Connor Rice, is a paid, paid private investigator and former Alba, Albuquerque police officer with a sordid past. Rice has no firsthand knowledge of the incident, was not involved in the initial investigation, yet he testified about both. Well, he may have secondhand knowledge. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. People read reports. As long as they're saying, I'm reading this report, it's secondhand knowledge. This is consistent with my experience, training, and expertise. There's nothing inappropriate about that. All right, folks. So now we're here at B. We're 33 pages into this 59-page document. I'm going to end this show right here. Um, and uh, I'll I'll try to do another show tomorrow afternoon after church and get through the rest of this. And then I'll plan to schedule uh, reading the state's response, which is half the length of this document on Monday. I think that's the best way to go. I will take a look at Q&A in just a moment. Uh, if you're a law self-defense member, of course, put your Q&A into the um, chat. Uh, and if you are on YouTube watching this, first of all, if you're on YouTube, please, a thumbs up and a subscribe would be nice. I'm 34 people away from 63,000 subscribers on YouTube. So that would be nice. There's a thousand of you here. Um, if if 34 of you would care to subscribe that aren't already subscribers, and you might check because sometimes YouTube just unsubscribes people, uh, that would get me to 63,000. That would be a nice Saturday. Uh, so hit that subscribe and, and uh, thumbs up. That's all free. What's not free is if you want to uh, post a question or comment for me to address, that needs to be a $10 super chat. Members get their questions answered for free. You can become a member for 99 cents. Get all your questions answered for free instead of $10 a pop on YouTube at lawofselfdefense.com slash trial. And that gets you a two-week trial membership. And after that, it's still dirt cheap. It's less than the cost of one Super Chat to be a member for a month. Less than $10 a month to be a Law of Self-Defense member once the trial is over. About once the trial membership is over about 30 cents a day at law of slash trial. And before I get to Q and a, don't forget about our upcoming law of self-defense advanced class. This is our full day class teaches you everything you need to know 
about being hard to convict if you're ever compelled to use force in defense of yourself, your family, your property. We only teach this class twice a year, folks. It's taught live by me on Saturday, April 20th, streamed to your computer. Plenty of opportunity for live Q&A, but we only teach it twice. If you miss this Saturday, April 20th class, it'll be October at best before we do it again. Can you afford to wait that long before you have this expertise on board? What if you get attacked before October? Don't allow yourself to be an easy target for prosecution. Learn more at lawofselfdefense.com slash advanced. And this weekend, it's the last opportunity to get 50% off early registration uh, the last week. And this is only, a, this class is a week from today, folks. So Monday, it goes up to the full registration price. Don't be a sucker. Sign up this weekend, lawofselfdefense.com slash advanced. And now let's take a look at Q&A. Let's see. Yes, Kyle, a Saturday bonus show. <clears throat> a weekend live. Uh, let's see. Somebody quotes Hank. Chuck quotes Hank Williams Jr. Just send me to hell or New York City. It would be about the same to me. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I put this together at the last minute, folks. Yeah, Morrissey is meticulous. Accusing her of mismanagement or wrongdoing is sticking your face in a buzzsaw. I concur. I don't think the judge is going to like it either. The judge knows Morrissey. You think the judge knows any of these New York City lawyers? You think she you, you think she has more confidence and trust in them now than she did a month ago after getting this motion now? Yeah. Yeah, Carrie Morrissey reminds the court, by the way, where all these lawyers are from. <laughs> Every single one of them. Every state. And it's mostly New York. And the ones that are not from New York work for the New York law firm. They're just satellite offices around the country. Uh, let's see. I can't read every comment, folks. My voice is really giving out. So if I don't read one of yours, um, don't take it personally. Bump, 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 bump. All right. That looks like all, all the substantive member comments. Let me see. If we have anything from today, what's today? The 13th. And we don't on Super Chat. So that is, that's cool with me. Don't forget our class Saturday, April 20th, lawofselfdefense.com slash advanced. And until then, folks, I remind all of you that if you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill. That's why I carry a gun. So I'm hard to kill. So my family is hard to kill. That's why I carry a knife. Why I carry pepper spray. Why I study jujitsu. If you do any of those things, so you're hard to kill, so your family is hard to kill. You also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law so you're hard to convict as well. Again, I'll try to do a show uh, Sunday afternoon finishing this motion by the uh, defense. Um, I'll send out an email once I have a better fix on my Sunday afternoon schedule, uh, which is partly subject to family influences. And until then, I remain Attorney Andrew Branca for the Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe.